Good morning, and welcome to the forum. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral, and it's such a blessing to have you all here this foggy morning in San Francisco. And we're especially delighted um, today. Uh, we have, this year, we, we made this the year of truth, so that's our theme this year. Um, and we, uh, two weeks ago, talked about, um, with uh, Robert Sapolsky, the neuroscientist, about mm -hmm. um, us versus them, the way the, the brain identifies somebody as, uh, as different mm -hmm. or the same within milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last week, we talked to Jeff Chang about um, what it means to be Asian American in America today. Um, and we talked a little bit about the anti-apartheid rallies in the mm -hmm. 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, and this week, um, we have a, a wonderful guest, um, through her experience uh, growing up in apartheid South Africa, her work at the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town, and the Historical Race Relations in Institute at Fisk University, and in her new role working on racial and economic issues at the Cathedral of All Souls in Tennessee, this is the perfect person to talk about truth and reconciliation. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Tutu. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I only went to um, South Africa once in my life. I received one of those, um, those grants for um, sabbatical. So mm -hmm. you go on sabbatical. And so we had a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Oh, wow. And um, we, were, we just arrived. And I almost fell down the stairs because I was so disoriented because of the time change. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Naomi has similarly just come from South Africa. So we've got to be really careful on the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing is um, <laughs> Naomi will be preaching at the 11 o'clock service, so we have to be sure to um, finish right on, um, on time. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about just what your earliest memories growing up were, and then maybe you, that could lead into kind of a description of just what, what apartheid felt like for a child um, mm -hmm. in, in South Africa. Yeah, and I, I, I always tell people that I think from my conversations with family and friends, I realize that for each of us, um, our entry into knowing what apartheid meant has a particular story. And for yeah. me, the, the first real impact that I, I knew of, I mean, obviously I experienced apartheid even before then, but the first experience that I really knew of was that um, from the time I was six and a half until I was nine, my older sister and my older brother and I went to boarding schools in Swaziland, uh. which is a neighboring country, um, because my parents didn't want us to go through Bantu education and were fortunate enough to be able to make that choice. Um, and, and so for me, the first um, experience of apartheid was that two-day trip from Alice in the Eastern Cape to Swaziland and realizing that my parents mapped out the trip according to the garages that would allow black people to use the bathroom. So, and so if something happened in between those garages, then you either had to hold on really tight or use the bush. Yeah. And so for me, the because we would stop at other gas stations, we needed to stop at other gas stations to put in gas, but that, that seeing the places where it was, the, and for me it was the toilet that was the important place, um, that those toilets that said whites only, um, were, that was for me the recognition of apartheid as right. a six and a half year old. Right, right, so your whole life is just so redirected, just even where you live was determined mm -hmm. by that. Exactly. What your education was like. What your access, what jobs you could hold, um, where you could live. And, and I think that you know, the boarding school thing for me was such a big thing because um, we lived in Alice on the campus of the Federal Seminary. And so what, what was going on at that time was that the main um, Protestant denominations had one seminary um, in Alice and that they shared the seminary, but then there were different colleges for the different denominations. And we were at St. Peter's, which was the, the Anglican um, uh, seminary, the, the Anglican college. And so living on the seminary, we were actually living in a multiracial community so that the black professors and their families lived on campus as well as white professors and their families. But the white professor's children could go to 
school down the street. Oh, gosh. And because my parents wanted us to have a good education, we had to go to school two days drive away. Yeah. So that, that too, you know, so, so this, which is why I always tell people that, you know, for, so when I talk to friends, our entry into a recognition of what apartheid meant in your life, for all of us was a little bit different. There was a different story that made you aware how apartheid impacted every aspect of our lives. And for me, the big thing was around school, the travel to school, and the, just the experience of being away from my family uh -huh. for nine months of the year as a six and a half year old, yeah. a seven year old. Um, so yeah. What, um, what sense did you have that things might be changing? What, I mean, did you imagine that it could be different in the future? Did, as a child, did you just take it so for granted that that's the way it was, that you, you had a hard time imagining it being different? I did have a hard time imagining it being different, but I was surrounded by a community that kept telling me that it was going to be different. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, people talk about my parents, but, you know, my parents were no different, I don't think, from um, the other adults who were in my life who, um, who kept assuring us that, you know, apartheid was not the end of the story. Right. And um, I mean, and, and again, and the, the ways that they did that were, were also interesting. So I, I, I say that this, this idea of a community, um, one of the things was that when you got your report card, so at the end of term, the report card didn't, it didn't end up in your home. It went with you up and down the street to all the adults in the community <laughs> to show them how you're doing in school. All right. Um, and, you know, if you were doing well, you got money and candy. And if you weren't doing well, you got lectures. <laughs> I got a lot of lectures. Um, <laughs> You see, it turned out okay, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and in those lectures, you know, because even as a young person, you, you, taught, you, were, you, you came to recognize that apartheid limited the options for you, right, as a black, particularly as a black girl. And I, I, can, I can remember, you know, saying to people, well, you know, why should I work hard and try and excel you know, apartheid, you know, there, there, there are no options for me. And, and in those lectures, you know, people from my grandmother who never went beyond elementary school would say, because this is not the end of the story. This is not the country that, this is not the way this country will always be. And we expect you to prepare yourself for a free South Africa. And, and, um, and, and so even in the, you know, even in the darkest days when I, I really did think that, you know, given the might of the apartheid government, how can you even see who could overthrow that might? That even in those darkest days, there was this community that kept on saying, this is not the end of the story. Oh, yeah. This is not the story of your life. And um, my mother's mother was really strong about that. And, um, and she is the only one, in fact, of my grandparents who lived to vote in our first democratic oh. election. And after the election, she, she actually said to me, you know, do you remember that I told you that this day would come in your lifetime, uh -huh. that you would live in a free South Africa? And look at this amazing gift from God that I actually get to experience it too. Uh, um, and so, yeah, so again, yeah. you know, just as your entry into apartheid is a particular story, also I think that when we uh, talk yes. about our transition to democracy, for each of us there's a particular story. And for me, it is very much my grandmother who, um, who voted for the first and last time in her life at 90 years of age. 
So. I, I love that. I, I just love um, it, it, her encouragement to you and just mm -hmm. her sense of hope. Uh, and uh, it just is that wise elder who's just seen so many things before mm -hmm. and can recognize the change will happen in the future. And I, I wonder for you, you're, you're, you, you and I are kind of on the cusp of becoming those wise elders too. <laughs> I know, isn't it? We've got to get ready. Elder, I'll accept. <laughs> I don't know about wise. <laughs> uh, we've got to get ready. We've got to prepare. But I do think, I mean, there'll be so many um, young people in um, South Africa and around the world who just mm -hmm. won't have had the experiences that you have mm -hmm. a as a child growing up. Uh, like, what do you want them to know about what apartheid was like when you were a child? And, you mm -hmm. know, what do you think um, y you need to teach them about, you know, what happened um, mm -hmm. when they didn't have that, that ex same ex experience growing up themselves? Yeah, and, um, you know, I mean, funnily enough, uh, you know, I, I one of the things about having been raised in apartheid was that my, you know, my holding on to my children will not experience what I've experienced. Uh, praise God yeah. that they will, you know, that they will live in uh, a, a very different world. Um, and and so then, after our last presidential election, I had um, I had my middle child in the room with me and one of her best friends on the phone yeah. sobbing. Uh, you know, like, what, what does this mean that America thinks of us as, as, as people of color? I mean, right. how, how can this be the decision that this country has made? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and I was able to then say to them, you have to remember who you are and, and what you come from. In a, in a situation like that, that, that you come from in this country um, a, a people who have gone through slavery, yeah. a people who have gone through Jim Crow, a people who, whose humanity has been questioned throughout the right. establishment of this country. From our context, you come from a people who experienced colonialism, a people who were, again, dehumanized and told that they were less than human um, on the continent of their own, um, their, own, their own home continent, that you come from a people who went through a system like apartheid that tried to tell us that we were not fully children of God. Yeah. And, and that if you hold on to the, the, the struggles of your ancestors and, and look at where we are now, then this is just a terrible blip, but <laughs> it's, it's a blip. Right, you know, right. this is not, again, this is not the end of the story. Yeah. This is, um, and, and that one of the things that I, I said to them that morning was, the most important thing that you can do th through this is to keep in yourself the sense of your own humanity. Yeah. Um, that if you do not allow um, the dehumanization that people try and put upon you to actually take hold in your body, right. in your spirit, in your psyche, then each day that you live, is a small victory. Right, right. Um, and 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 in, in talking to them, I mean, I and and talking to young people um, across this country and and even in South Africa, I, I I always say that if you if you remember the people who um, who we uphold as as our heroes, as our role models, that one of the things that they have in common was that they refused to be dehumanized. Yeah. And they also refused to dehumanize right. even those who were dehumanizing them. Yeah. Yeah. So that if you look at the story of, in South Africa, of a Nelson Mandela, of a Stephen Biko, that they, they were very clear that um, racism was not going to define who they were as human beings, but neither was was the dehumanization that was, that apartheid, Jim Crow was trying to impose on them, would make them turn from 
their re their recognition right. of the humanity of others. Yeah, that's so so powerful. I and mean, such a Christian message too. I mean, mm -hmm. that's I mean, in a way, that's what Jesus was about. At the, his very heart was not not hating the people who were who were persecuting, persecuting him, but recognizing the the social forces too that were involved in, mm -hmm. in what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I I I, I love to imagine you. Um, I mean, uh, my my wife went went to um, boarding school for a long time, and mm -hmm. um, uh, and it, it really prepared her. Like when she went to college, she. She was, she was, it wasn't a big step for her. She, mm -hmm. she was, um, but I, I try to imagine you coming to the United States um, when you came to college mm -hmm. in the 70s. And just, I, I wonder what your first impressions of just the racial experience here was mm -hmm. after having been in South Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, what did it feel like to be in this different context, but was, with still very strong racism? Mm. And I was in Kentucky, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is which another story. It's another story. It's another thing to learn. I mean, <laughs> uh, and, and another the thing about, uh, yeah. w and I, tell, I always tell people that that my my learning from that is, do not give up geography right. in high school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so that you Keep know listening. where you're heading. Know for where college. you're heading exactly. Okay. Oh, that's um, great. But um, when my wife came to college in North America, she said everything is so clean here. <laughs> Because she didn't know <laughs> geography either. <laughs> uh, yeah, see. Um, so, you know, the, the interesting thing for me was to come here and to see um, the racial script in a way flipped. Yeah. So, you know, with, with my dad being who he was in South Africa, we would get um, visitors from around the world right. coming to... Presidents and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> coming to um, the South African Council of Churches or, and, um, and, and, and often our responsibility as the family was basically to be the hosts, to right, take people right. shopping and you know, all that kind of stuff. And there would, be, there would be from time to time that there would be African Americans or Afro-Europeans who would be, would be part of the people visiting yeah. us. And, and to be with them in uh, shops in South Africa and have white South Africans right in front of me, you, mind you, say to them things like, well, you know, you're not like our blacks. Oh, you know, you yeah, are, right. You know, you are, you are, right, right. You are sophisticated, you are cultured, yeah. you are all of, all of yeah. these things that, you know, yeah. so it's, it's different with our blacks. Yeah. And, um, and then came here and all of a sudden I'm the not the hour black, <laughs> right? And, and, and the attempt to make me into this exotic African who's not like African Americans. You know, your experience is so different from our blacks. I'm like, first of all, this hour thing <laughs> is problematic, you know? But apart, from but apart from that, for me, it was like, you know, I've heard this from the other side, right. so, to me, I can hear the diminution that is trying to take place. Diminution, that's not a word. I, get I just it. made I it totally up. I totally understand that. I just made I, it up. It should but be a it word. sounds good. <laughs> it sounded great. Uh, um, so I, I get that. And, um, and so that for me was really striking was so this is what racism does. This is one of the ways that racism um, contorts itself to make sense of itself. Right, right. So. Um, and so to be able, and, and, and you know, I mean, and, and, and to be clear that apartheid took that to its logical conclusion. So that under apartheid, blacks who were not South African were honorary white. Uh, that was the, actually the designation uh, that they were honorary white while they were in South Africa. And so I would say to African Americans all the time, I'm like, you missed your chance. Yeah. <laughs> You could have found out what it's like to be white <laughs> if you come to South Africa under apartheid. Uh, yeah. That would have been your experience, yeah. okay? Um, but so, but I mean that the the reality of um, I hadn't changed. Right, of course. Right? I was still the same the person I'd been in yeah. South Africa, coming to the U.S. But the fact that I had a slightly different accent or a very different accent. Um, a, was a, a way f for, f for white society to, um, to do this divide and conquer, right? right? right. That, you know, you, no, you are, you, you're a different type of black. Uh, 
yeah. um, and, and, and therefore you are more acceptable. Um, and yeah, so that was, the, that was what was really striking yeah. for me. Um, and, and it was, you know, and the other thing that, that was striking was that it was the first time <clears throat> that I was in a context where, um, I, where the, that differentiation played out even within our community. Right, right. So, um, so in talking to um, other students from the African continent coming to the U.S. that who were also students with me at Berea was that given the the cultural picture that was portrayed on the continent of you know the, what we saw in the movie right, right right completely um, that many of them said you know our parents warned us to stay away from African Americans because uh, the picture the cultural picture right, that we right, have uh, that is that is portrayed of African yeah. Americans in movies etc that we saw right, exactly. were you know criminals drug pushers yeah. all of that all of yeah. that stuff and um, and then talking to African Americans that you know what is the picture that you see of Africans? Right. And it is you know, savages. Right. Um, you know, that the the one brave person on the continent is Tarzan. The one <laughs> the one white man. Right? Uh, yeah. Um so the you know, so for me it was that opportunity to look at how the portrayal of our people across across cultures, across mm. countries, the impact that it has on our, even our perceptions of ourselves right. and one another. Yeah, and the way it builds those walls. Yes. And that's why it's so important how people are portrayed in film, media, exactly. and whatnot. I, I think about social media too, because in a way it, it is a, a little bit of a chance to be, to be more, I mean, what happened with me and my personal story of social media, we had an artist in residence who was a poet. She was like mm. in her 20s, she was hapa, half, um, Japanese half white, mm -hmm. um, and and she said, "Listen, you gotta you gotta you gotta do Twitter because mm -hmm. you'll hear from different people that you would mm -hmm. never hear from." Mm. And I wonder just w what your take on it all is. I mean, I, I have friends in my generation who just like have nothing to do with it, and then I have friends who are all in. I just wonder what you. I mean, because you, you know, what is your experience of social media, and just how helpful is it? You know, mm -hmm. kind of for the struggle as we go forward. Yeah, I'm not completely all in because it's. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's I mean, that's what's killing me. I mean, I, I just, it wears I mean, me out. And sometimes I, I just, just don't want to deal. I have friends who seem to be tweeting like, yeah. so how do you get anything else done? Yeah, yeah. If I, I, you're tweeting all the time what you're doing. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but I, I, I do, I do enjoy catching up on it um, every once in a while. And, and I do think that it's been an important um, tool um, for to connect people, though I mean I also think that it's also an important tool to divide Dis people. Yeah, divide and um, that you yeah. know that it, it is how we choose to use it. I I do think that though it has been important in highlight you know, letting people see you know like the Arab Spring to right. see what is going on in real time to hear from people on the ground at at, at events at protests to hear from people what is the story of um, you know what is going on in their community in their country what are the struggles that they are facing so so I think that it's a it's a it's a wonderful yeah. tool but I mean we have also seen that like you know how it yeah. can be used to um, you know, to to again to dehumanize. Yeah, yeah. So I do think that it's about it's not so much about the tool; it's about how we choose to use right, it. Right, right. And I know that I'm I'm way past being able to to be a, a real Twitter person or a real Facebook Insta or, person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I I think I'm doing really well to check my Facebook. Yeah, you yeah. Know. Oh, I know um, what you mean. And, and 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 I love that because yeah. you know that keeps me in contact with people who I grew right, up right, with, exactly. people all over the world. But yeah, I, I mean, I think that young people, though, um, are, using, are using those social media in, 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 in some pretty amazing ways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like Black Lives Matter. And mm -hmm. the, even just like, I, I think a lot of things that we would treat as just like um, idiosyncratic incidents, oh, that just happened that one time. Mm -hmm. it, it, it helps to us to see a to big see pattern, the exactly. The so the, the way the police force res 
responds in Ferguson's not so different than the way it was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, so that part, I think, is... Yeah. Um, but she, she was great. I mean, she just... Young people just totally raised my consciousness. <laughs> you, you do too. But. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit about just the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm especially interested in just how that was then and just kind of like what its ongoing effects are. Like, I mean, every year that passes, it becomes more part of the history of South Africa mm -hmm. and the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I just like, what do we learn about it as, t as time goes on? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that one of the things that for me is important for people to know is to recognize that the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a compromise yeah. in, uh, in, a in the transition um, from apartheid. So there were, you know, people on the one hand who were saying that, you know, the level of human rights atrocities that occurred in South Africa was a level that needed something like Nuremberg trials. Right, right, And of that course. people would be... Yeah brought up on trial held and held responsible yeah. and, 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 and sent to jail. And then there was, on the other hand, you know, people who were saying, well, you know, if we want to move forward as a country, we just need to wipe everybody's slate clean, forgive and forget, and just move on into wow. the new South Africa and, you know, forget the past. Wow. And, and Which so it sounds horrible to me. I can't imagine you go to the grocery store and there's the person who killed your son, right? In the exactly. You know, aisle. Yeah. Um, and 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 then that and also that there would be no, you know, th this attempt to pretend that there is no memory. Right. Yeah. You yeah. know, so you know, we wipe the slate clean. You can't. You can't. Human you know, this is this, yeah. these have been people's stories. Yeah. But and and so the TRC was like a, a, a midpoint. So there was not going to be the wiping the slate clean, but there were not going to be trials either um, that the TRC gave people the opportunity to apply for amnesty yeah. for human rights violations. And, um, and in applying for amnesty, the only, the, the requisites were that you tell the whole truth, um, that you show that there is um, some, there was some political motivation for your acts, and that there was some l level of, uh, you know, that the act made sense in the context of what you were trying to achieve. Uh. So that, so, and, 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 and that becomes uh, important because when you, when you see that Eugene de Kock or, or Prime right. Evil oh, yeah. is not given amnesty even after he does show that there's political motivation, and he does show, does tell the truth, yeah. but that the the level of of um, the acts that he committed right. was, you know, th when you lead a death squad that kills people as they sleep, that that yeah, a yeah, whole yeah, family exactly. or families right, right. that there, that that there isn't the the balance between the act and what you're trying to achieve. When, when you lead death squads that go into neighboring countries and right. kill South oh, Africans yeah. and, um, and um, uh, citizens of those countries, that, again, th that balance is, is, is missing. Yeah. So, and, and, and clearly missing from that requirement is, was any requirement for remorse. Mm. So there was not, you know, no part of the commission's work was if you want amnesty, you have to show remorse for your acts. Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to show remorse. It's truth. It's um, political um, motivation. Um, so that was one committee of, of, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Amnesty Committee. Right. Um, and, and then the second was the Human Rights Committee. Uh. And the Human Rights Committee was the committee that heard the stories of those who were victims and mm. survivors right. of human rights abuses. Yes. Um, and, and, and those are the stories, I think, that got the most coverage worldwide. Right, exactly. That's that, what we think of. I, that I, I think people, of, yeah. The stories of those who suffered. Um, and then the last was the reparations committee right, exactly. that was meant to come up with some way that uh, as a country we, we pay reparations to those who were victims and survivors. Yes, yeah. Um, what did your father say about just the whole process as it was occurring and then just kind mm -hmm. of in retrospect about it? So, I mean, as it was occurring, he and I had differences of opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
about it. And 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 for me, one was the that the amnesty committee. So once somebody received amnesty, that was it. Wow. Yeah. They received amnesty, and it wasn't Forever. just amnesty from criminal prosecution by the government, but it also meant that you had amnesty from any civil prosecution by your victims, uh. right, or their families. So it was like, as soon as you got amnesty, that was it. You walked out, you were free to go, carry on your life, um, no questions asked. Right, and and I and I understand that remorse cannot be a requirement because all of us know of the times when our parents have told us to say I'm sorry to your sibling. Oh yeah, completely. or as parents we have right, said right. say sorry to your brother or sister, yeah. and you know so, I'm sorry. Yeah. Really, <laughs> what a waste of energy. Yeah. Um, and so the, so the remorse part I could understand, but the idea that that there was no then asked to take some level of responsibility in saying, even for instance, you know, you took something from us right. as a country. You, pro you profited financially. So and you still have four private jets. And or, and or, or even, you know, even if we're not talking about the wealthy, if we're talking about the police. Right. Or the, the uh -huh. um, who, who, you know, the secret police who beat up Steve Biko or, uh -huh. you know, any number of people. That to say then at least we require some level of community service from you right. to help rebuild our country. Yeah, yeah. So even if it is helping build schools in rural communities or giving six months of service in a township where you had been one of the torturers, that, that, you know, that to me was, how can we, why do we not ask right, right. for something like that? And I mean, and... Nobody asked my opinion, so that wasn't part of the act. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and that was one of the, you know, that was one of the, the discussions that, um, that, that I had with my father at, at, at that time. And also, you know, the reality is that when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission started its work, it was viewed negatively by the vast majority of South Africans, yeah, for yeah. one reason or another. Right, so right. white South Africans were saying, this is a, a witch right. hunt. We should sleep the this clean. Is, you know, right, we just wiped the slate clean. Oh, gosh, so yeah. this is just a witch hunt to try and make us feel guilty for what has happened. And black South Africans were like, you know, this is like really get out of jail free yes, cards right, being handed exactly, out. Yeah. And so, and, 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 in the, in the conversations with my father at the time, he was like, you know, if you have people opposed to it so much from different perspectives, then there has to be something good <laughs> in, in this work, oh, right? If, it, if everybody can find a weakness in it, then there has to be some level of strength right, in, right. in the process. <laughs> Eternal uh, optimist is what he is. Uh -huh. um, so, um, and, 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 and I think that for me, one of the, one of the things was the opportunity of being in South Africa during that process and the opportunity of, of, of going to hearings and meeting people who were um, coming, particularly to the Human Rights um, Committee, to tell their stories was so important for us as a country in claiming our whole story. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Um, and um, so, I mean, I heard powerful, powerful testimony from um, people coming to the Human Rights Committee. And, and one of the most striking things that I actually heard was not, it wasn't even testimony. It was a letter sent in by a young white man to the commission. Um, and, and in that letter, he says, you know, um, he starts off saying, I didn't know. I didn't know about all the things that were happening in our country. Yeah. I didn't know what was going on in the townships. I didn't know about, um, you know, the, 
uh, how the state of emergency impacted people's lives. I didn't know how um, banning and banishment affected people. I didn't know. And, and so he goes through all of these things that he didn't know. And then at the end he says, and yet I realized that I chose not to know. Right, right, yeah. So that there was a part, and, and for me, that was a statement about our country. Right, right. right? Yeah. About, I and chose... And a statement about our country. Well, and, and, and that's what I've said when I, talk about, when I talk to people about, you know, what are the learnings of the TRC that I think right, might make here sense in, the US. In, this, exactly. in this country. I, that's exactly what and, I'm And for me, it is about what is it about the story of this country that we choose not to yeah. know. Right, over and over again. Over and over again, yeah. and, um, and 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 I and I and I tell the story of teaching a class at, at the University of Hartford on um, the Black experience in in the Western Hemisphere, and asking my students what it is that they are interested in learning about, and being amazed at the number of students who said they wanted to learn about slavery, mm. and I'm like. We're at a university. What have you been doing right. in your history oh, exactly. and social studies yeah. classes all through right. K through 12? And then having children in the K through 12 system right, in this of course, country. So you know. And then finding out that, you know, in a good history book, slavery is a chapter. In yeah. most history books, it's a paragraph. Yeah. As though it's a chapter or a paragraph in U.S. Right, history, exactly. which... We know it's not. Yeah, it's, it's a multi-volume, right. at least, yeah. um, saga of how we got to where we are. And then going to teach at Brevard College in North Carolina and recognizing that all of my time in the U.S., I had never heard, I had never been taught, and I did U.S. history because it's a requirement in a liberal arts college. Yeah, yeah. Never heard of the Trail of Tears. Oh, wow. And I'm like, how, that is amazing. How do we yeah. say we're educating our children right. about the story of our country when these huge parts of what made this country what it is today are missing right. from our, our story? Right. And so that to me was... The, you know, the, the really important part about the, the TRC. And, I, and I, I assure you, you don't know how many white South Africans I met in the, you know, as the TRC was going on saying, I didn't know. Right, right. I didn't know. Yeah. And, 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 and having heard that young man's letter, I would ask, so at what point did you choose not to right, know? Right, exactly. And, 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 and now that you know what how do does do that now? how does that change exactly. how you live in, in a new South Africa? Yeah, yeah. And it it's been a it's been a mixed bag. Yeah, but yeah. um but I think that uh even you know even in in talking about our story, uh there is as a South African, right, there is the the inclination even to to be pushing forward this whole narrative of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and pushing forward the whole story of uh, you know Nelson Mandela who comes out of of, of 27 yeah. years of imprisonment and is the moving force behind a truth and reconciliation right, process. Right. And, uh, you know, in, and in his personal life, lives that too. Not just, it's not just an, an act of parliament right, for him. Right. It is the way that he lives, um, even in terms of his relationship with his previous jailers. Um, and to have him in a way that only he could, because somebody else saying it might have sounded um, arrogant, but for him to say that, you know, as South Africans, we cannot say that we are the country that gave the world a Nelson Mandela and a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, unless we are also willing to say that we are a country that gave the world apartheid right. and a Eugene de Kock. Right, right, right? Exactly. So that those are both stories of South Africa. Yeah. And you cannot choose to highlight the Mandela story 
and pretend that the Dukak story doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, as you look around here, I mean, it, 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 the United States, I mean, it, it, it's, it feels very much like we need our own truth and reconciliation. <laughs> I mean, I just, uh, so how would, you, how would you go about that? And mm -hmm. how would you, like, reparations, too, it seems to make a lot of sense when, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, like, I, I was reading Thomas Piketty for my sermon last sermon. He's, mm -hmm. like, wrote that capital in the 21st century book. He said that the value of African slaves in America was equivalent to all the farms in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. like, the amount, number of people, that's the amount of... It, economics that was involved. So, so how, how, like, how do you begin to, to like do um, truth and reconciliation work when, when people are in such deep denial and how mm. do you move them out of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, for one, I know that it's very unlikely that a truth and reconciliation process in this country will come from a government, from the government. Oh, that's a good point. Um, so I, I, I don't think that it's going to look like the South African right, right. process. I do think, though, that it is, excuse me, it is possible to have a process um, that comes from grassroots mm. or from the church um, that is, looks at the local aspect of, um, of U.S. race, right, race right. Hist racial, racialized history. Um, and, 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 and we've seen some models, like the Greensboro um, Truth right, and Reconciliation yeah, exactly. Commission uh, coming out of the Klan killings yeah. there. That, that, that's, you know, that to me is, is, is a model, that what do you look at? Look at what happened in our particular community that affected our people's experience. Um, what is the racialized history of this particular community? So for me, I think that there's always an opportunity at the local level for, for, for communities to say, we are invested in a healing of our, of our community, a healing of our country, and we're, we're, we're not expecting it to come from on top, so it's gonna come from us down here. And, and, and we are willing, and sometimes it's, you know, it starts the Greensboro Commission started with two people yeah, saying, yes. we're going to call together people and say, let's hear your story. So that I think that at a local level that we, that we can start saying, having churches take the lead and saying, let's look at the racialized story of our community yeah. and, and what was the impact of race and racism in this community um, and what is the continuing um, right, impact, impact of, of, exactly. of, 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 of racism in, in our community and, and, and to start a process that is very local, very focused maybe on a particular, it start off as on a focus on a particular incident, but how that then ripples out into um, the racialized history of a community. Um, and and I mean, again, you know, reparations, that, that even in the South African context, I think is one of the places where the TRC really did fail. Yeah. Um, that, that there was a, a really small payment paid to um, uh, victims and survivors of, of human rights abuses, really as basically as a token, just saying this is a token of our under, you know, under understanding of the sacrifice that right, you made right. for, for the liberation of our country. But that, that, that to think out of the box in terms of what reparations can look like. And, and so, you know, in the South African context, people were saying we need to be giving scholarships to the children of, 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 of people who, um, who were killed yeah. um, as, as anti-apartheid um, activists. We need to be giving health care. We need to be thinking about um, access to housing, access to training, so that reparations doesn't have to be a cash payment right, to people. Right. Because as you know, what so often happens is when we, t when we think cash payments, we all start panicking and try to think of the smallest possible payment that we can make <laughs> to people to say that we've made a payment. Yeah. So, so maybe if we, if we let ourselves 
give up on the idea of a cash payment, but, but think about the ways in which people were denied access and how do we then open up access. And so in this country, when you think about, for instance, the GI Bill that gave opportunities to, to white returning yeah. military for housing, for education, for opportunities to, to become the middle class, that those were opportunities that were not available, that were not given mm -hmm. to, to black um, returning GIs. So, so how do we then give, make, make that um, right. Make that correction. Right. So that's one here. way of doing that's it. That's one way of doing that. that we, look about, yeah. we look about what is it, you know. Yeah, what's the present value of the, 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 the value of the of gifts that, that we gave that in we 1952 gave. Exactly. to a white family? And, you know, and how, how do we. And, talk and, about and it can be, a, I mean, as I say, it doesn't have to be cash. It can be opportunities, access to housing, access to education, which are the things that in this society give people opportunities. Yeah to move forward in this economic system. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, and especially, um, you know, uh, that, that the question of who, too, becomes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the, if you do work with GI families, then mm -hmm. you have the list of, you know, exactly who, you know, <laughs> served in World War II, and you know exactly which families those are, you, you know, so that's And not one. forgetting, not forgetting, though, that, you know, that at the end of slavery, people were assured that they were going to get 40 acres and a mule. Right, right. right? <laughs> so there's, there's a, there's, there is that claim on this country from the descendants of enslaved Africans. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and I would be quick to say I recognize that that, that would not be me. Right, or, right. Or my children yeah. as, as a, a first generation immigrant and th them as immigrant children, that this, that is not, that particular um, remedy, yeah. remedy is not one that is open to, to me and my children. But there are descendants of enslaved Africans in this country who never got any, um, any opportunity to truly move out of freedom right, right. before we yeah. then had yeah. um, a, 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 a system that put in place slavery right. in, 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 in a, a penal yeah. system. Right. And so, so what you're saying is that immigrants, too, are suffering under the same conditions that were created before they arrived mm -hmm. and, and, and have to live with that terrible racism also. Um, one of the traditions we have um, as part of the forum is we, we have questions that people write on cards, and um, Rebecca Nessel collects the questions, and she has pens, too, for you. Um, <laughs> so, so please be sure to, to write a question. Um, I, I would think so much about just like you're calling a, as a spiritual leader, and I was wondering mm -hmm. if you might talk a little bit about, about that. Oh, thank you. Um, just, uh, you know, kind of what, what led you to, I mean, you know, my grandfather was an Episcopal priest, and so it was kind of within the realm of possibility when mm -hmm. I was growing up. I had that example, and and. and and you too, you know, having your, you know, family members who are, like, yeah. uh, um, you know, was having your dad be who he was part of the reason you became ordained or was part of the reason why you didn't become ordained earlier? <laughs> the latter. The latter. Yeah, yeah, I totally remember um, that. And, and, yeah, and so the story of my birth, this is how far back it goes, right, <laughs> is that my father was actually at seminary when I was born and wasn't able to be there for my birth, but a friend of his was able to come. And, and when she went back, um, what she told him was, you know, this one looks so much like you. All we need to do is put on glasses and a cassock, and <laughs> she, she <laughs> could pass so at you as you. <laughs> so that was my first, the first story that I ever heard about myself was <laughs> that in cassocks and, a glass, in the cassocks and glasses, I would be my father. So my, 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 the one thing I knew from very early on in my life is that I would never be a priest. <laughs> never. I didn't care what, you know, that there was, that all the other jobs on the planet had ceased to exist. <laughs> that was the only way that I was possibly going to be right, a priest. Right. And, so I, I, and so I've gone through my life really knowing that that was my foundational place. That's where I started from not a priest, um, and, and, and have 
gone through, you know, I started off my, my professional life as an economist and then became, started working on race and gender issues um, and, 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 and felt like that was, that was my ministry. Right, like. completely, um, completely. And, um, and yet, even in that process, had a number of experiences where I, I, I felt a call to ordained ministry. Yeah, yeah. Um, starting as early as when I was 24 and had, in fact, just finished my first master's and, and really had this powerful experience where I thought, I'm being called to ordain ministry. I was like, ah, not really. <laughs> Move on. Um, and, 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 and have had those kinds of experiences right, right. throughout my life and, and kept saying it can't be true. Move on. And, and to the extent that when I finally did go to seminary, my mom was just, you know what? Until you actually get ordained, we're not even we're not, we're not even getting involved in this conversation anymore. We don't know how many times you've come to us and said, yeah. "This might be happening in my life." <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So for me, it has been more of I needed to be clear of making my own path and 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 using my own voice. And, um, and so st really stayed away from ordained ministry yeah. for most of my life. And, and finally um, had one of my spiritual directors say to me, you know what, you're going to have to stop and, and at least consider that possibility. Yeah, yeah, right. and, um, and, and just listen to what, what, what comes of right, that. Right, right. And, and, so, um, and so even then, you know, I was, uh, I, I, I always tell people that even then I was like, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to go to seminary. I'm going to go to div school. And God, I'm only applying to one div school. So if I'm meant to get in, <laughs> I will get in. If I'm not meant to get in, then obviously this is not a call because it's always good to have an attitude with God. Um, <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And, and, and found myself um, in, in, a, in, a, in a place where I actually had a hard time finding a, an, a church of the Anglican Communion that I felt welcomed, seen, and, and received right, in. Right, right. Um, and, and, and then Yeah, found it's, it's funny because you're right. I mean, dad is probably like the biggest celebrity of our, like, in, in, within memory. I, I, I can't think of somebody who, you know, is more prominent. And well, you're right. So Bishop Curry now go. since he preached at the royal wedding. Well, you that know, was what? nice. <laughs> I just don't know if it's going to hold. <laughs> that was really nice. But yeah, that, that is. So how do you find your place and, in, in, you know, and in, 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 in make your own way? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you did. It's so good <laughs> having you as a colleague. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I call you and ask you help on sermons now. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel that African Americans are oppressed today in this country? How These are <laughs> questions from out there. Okay. <laughs> um, where do we begin? <laughs> where, yeah, where do we begin, really? Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll use just a couple of examples from, from my own experience. So a couple of weeks ago, I um, was approached by a former student's wife who is doing research on black mothers raising black sons in the U.S. and asked me to be part of a focus group. Um, my, I have one son, um, 21 years old, and so she gathered a group of black women with black sons into a room and asked us to talk about what, what, what our experiences are as, as black mothers. And until I sat in that room with a group of women who looked like me or, you know, well, the range of, 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 of blackness, um, and, um, and shared our stories that I had really thought that I was on my own in, in many ways. So the one story that for me was like, this was me, was that um, whenever my son's name would come up on my cell phone, if it wasn't a time that we had agreed to speak, I started panicking. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that there had to be something that had gone wrong. That he's been arrested, he's been shot, he's been something. Right? And 
Every single one of those women in that room said they had the exact same experience. Mm. And we were women whose children ranged in age, whose sons ranged in age from nine to 25. So you think that the mother of a nine-year-old has different fears about her child than the mother of a 25-year-old. And the fact that for black mothers across the board, whether your son is nine or 25, when his name flashes on your cell phone, when he's not meant to be calling you, that rather than think, oh, I wonder what he has to tell me, that your first thing is, oh my God, what is wrong? tells me there is something seriously wrong about race in this country. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, you know, that's a small thing, right, in the, in, the, in the bigger context of what it means to be African American in this country. That you panic at a phone call, that's, I hate it, but that's not the same as a nine-year-old boy being told that he sexually assaulted a grown woman mm, because yeah. his backpack touched oh, her yeah. behind. Yeah. And as a white woman, she felt that she had the right to accuse a nine-year-old of sexually assault. Now, even if he had touched her behind with his hand, as a grown woman, my response is, what do you think you are doing? Not let me call the police that I've been sexually harassed by a nine-year-old child. Yeah, yeah. So again, to me, that is part of what it means to be African-American in this country. Yeah. That our children cannot walk in a grocery store, that our children cannot sell water on the side of the road, that our, oops, that, that our children can be shot for playing with a toy gun when we know that police can actually apprehend a grown man who has killed one of their own without killing him. Mm. So, yeah. That, those are the things that, to me, speak of African-American suffering in the U.S. in 2018. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because when my son calls on the cell phone, I'm not thinking, oh my gosh, someone's killed him. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you're totally right. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's, mm -hmm. that's, it, it has nothing to do with you know, what happens when you go to a job interview. It has nothing to do with exactly. what happens when you're in a class of all white students. It has nothing to I mean, there's so many examples, but that little sliver of the tip of the iceberg is, gives you a picture. Mm. Um, what is strongman politics? How do you create change in a strongman political climate? Tell me what is strong man politics. I know, it's good. That's a good question because it's written very clearly so I can <laughs> read it and it's short. <laughs> uh, you're getting a lot of little love letters, by the way, in these, these questions. I'm oh. putting the love letters on the side. Oh, so I'll okay, give them thank to you. you. Afterwards. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I think that strong man politics is probably the, the dominant political um, idea that we've lived with forever, right? That, that leaders need to be strong, dominant, and um, yeah, a and I was going to say, and white, um, but I mean, we have that, in, in, when we look on, on, on the African continent, we have that same idea of, um, of, of, of presidents, of leaders that we, we, that we say we want strong men, um, or at least that's what we are taught that we need, right? right? right. Um, what they tell us we need. What they tell us we need, and that um, that you know we need people who can be respected, um, not people who not a leader who should be loved. That you know we we that we want uh, we want leaders who can m make their points forcefully and force people to do what they want. Uh, and and I think that the only way that we are going to change that is by changing our idea of what leadership is, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, and for me, the real leaders I, I have encountered have been people 
who are, first of all, confident in who they are. Because most of the people who I see as strong men, leaders, actually, confidence is not, self-confidence is not who they really are. That they need to project this dominant persona, 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 English is my fourth language, people. Uh, I was going to uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, they, that, that the reason that they need to project this dominant persona has often to do with a, a, a lack of self-confidence. And, and so when I think of somebody like President Mandela, who, you know, even in the context of the negotiations with the apartheid government, so very often people were saying to him, do not talk to them because that will make you look weak. Right, right. And, and his thing was, I know who I am, and I know what I am struggling for, and so I can walk into this meeting with anybody, because what they are going to say or do will not detract from my sense of my own humanity. Yeah, yeah. And so I think we, what we need to be grooming are leaders who are so comfortable in their sense of their humanity, who are so comfortable in their sense of their own self-worth that they do not need to belittle or demean others in order to, to, to be leaders. Right, right. Um, yeah. That's so beautiful. That's, I, I, it's such an important image. I, I think part Thank of it you. too is is when you have that confidence, you're you're, you're more comfortable about I I involving more other people, other people. in the decisions. You know, exactly. You don't feel like it, all the weight is just on you. It's just you. like it's almost like you're kind of a convener of of, of a mm -hmm. group of people who can come up with the best solution. Mm. Um, we don't have very much time left because we got to give you a rest before you preach, even if it's only ten minutes of rest. <laughs> okay. But um, I wonder what signs of hope you see just in the United States, around the world. You know mm. what what like, who are some of your heroes now? What, what, do we, you know, what are the good things that, that, that we might see around us that, that might give us a, a sense of hope? I love what you said about you know, the blip earlier, mm -hmm. um, but, but <laughs> I, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. Well, I mean, I, for me, one of the greatest parts of hope is seeing young people yeah. and seeing them become involved in a way that I think we haven't seen maybe since um, Vietnam and the anti-apartheid movement, yeah. that that movement of young people in high school, in, in universities, of, of, of taking up leadership around issues, whether it is um, school shootings right. or um, violence against um, people of color by, by police, to, to see young people uh, stepping up and, and speaking out and organizing right. um, a, in opposition to, to, to a, 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 what seems to me to be a system that is trying to pull us backwards um, in terms of, of, of human relations. Um, the even uh, I, I like the new language they give us for understanding Understanding what is... Yeah. What, and, 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 and to be honest, when I think about my heroes, um, it's it really is not even so much named people right, right, as yeah. my. For me, the heroes are. I, I, I get a chance to go to um, Peace Jam events, uh, you know, yeah, Peace Jam, yeah, right. which is the organization that brings young people together with uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, winners. And to go to these events and to see young people identifying issues in their community and then coming up with ways different ways of, of dealing with yeah. those issues, that those are my heroes, yeah. that, that, that they are thinking out of the box of how do we deal with hunger and homelessness and racism and, and, and sexual violence. Um, those are my heroes that are looking, sometimes not even looking globally, looking right very focused on the community in which they live and saying, I want my community to be the best community yeah. that it can possibly be. Um, and it's, you know, my heroes are 
the, the young, particularly young women who are putting themselves forward as political candidates right, right, that's true in, too. You know, in the elections. It's just like, you know, yes, uh, <laughs> we need yeah. to be seeing young women. We need to be seeing young people of color putting themselves forward and saying, I, I am ready to be a leader in this, in this yeah. country and I am the kind of leader that this country actually needs. Yeah. Those are my yeah, heroes. I agree. It's so, so inspiring. Young yeah. people today are just are, are extraordinary. I wish we'd had more of a chance to talk about so many things like <laughs> spirituality, gender, and, and, and sexual violence. Or, mm. I mean, Rebecca Solnit is our, our, our visitor next week oh, and okay. is, uh, has written so much about um, you know, the mm -hmm. pandemic of violence against mm -hmm. women. But um, we do have to let you ha have a chance to pre prepare. Um, uh, please join me next week um, when our guest will be Rebecca Solnit, and she'll be talking about her new collection of essays on American crises, call them by their true names. You're welcome to join us at 11 o'clock for the best part, which is going to be Naomi's sermon for today. <laughs> um, the men and boys choir will be beautiful too. Um, we do want to remind you that we rely on your support for the forum, so if you can make a gift, there's a little box there for gifts. And um, please join with me thanking Naomi. You, you're such a gift to Thank us. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.